Interior design trends and houseplants. You'd think that these two passions would go together like two peas in a pod, but interestingly enough, they can sometimes be at war with each other. We can find ourselves desperately wanting to style plants in rooms with no light or low light, or getting overwhelmed with figuring out how to make our homes look planty and not totally cluttered. Many plant people don't really know the first thing about interior design trends, and many interior designers don't know the first thing about plant care, even if they really want to put plants in their designs. I recently met Betsy of the Affordable Interior Design Podcast, and we decided to huddle up and see how we can match our compatible but different skill sets and bring them together to help our communities make beautiful spaces that have healthy plants in them. And we came up with this really fun collaborative episode where we play matchmakers of sorts. So Betsy breaks down various design styles and how to execute them in your home, and I play matchmaker and pick plants that would suit those aesthetics. It's a super fun chat that I hope will leave you ready to elevate your home and grow more joy in your lives. So welcome. Blue Mango Radio. Plant friends, I'm going to be real with you. I personally have like zero eye for design. (laughs) I've always really been jealous of my friends with great interior design sense. I've got a big passion for plants. I love having plants in my home. I love making my home feel cozy and planty, but I feel like when I go to design my house, it's always about the plants first, and I don't really care about the couch or the coffee table. And because of that, sometimes our homes have looked a little wacky. (laughs) People talk about design rules and different styles, and I'm always at a loss. So I thought it would be fun to have an interior designer come on to help educate our community so maybe we could learn a thing or two about interior design and apply it to our planty homes. Because listen, our plant community is always going to prioritize our plants and want our houses filled with plants, but learning about things that we talk about in today's episode, like the rule of three or how to space plants out or even being able to identify your design style in order to better organize your space and then learn how you can pepper plants in to complement the design style. All of this information is only going to help us continue to bloom and grow the most beautifully cozy, homey places for us to live and care for our plants. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Before we dive in, it would mean so much to me if you left a positive review for Bloom and Grow Radio on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Those reviews and ratings really help us get to as many planty earbuds across the globe as humanly possible. So thanks in advance. Okay, plant friends, Betsy is lovely. She hosts her own show, the Affordable Interior Design Podcast. She's lovely and really gives us so many tips. So as we work through the styles, even if she's talking about a style that you don't prefer... She gives a lot of interior design wisdom, uh, little like nuggets of tips and tricks within each style. So definitely listen through each style because you're going to gain something from each one. And also, if you have plants that you feel like I missed in this matchmaking series that you feel like would really go well with the coastal style or the glam style, hit me up on Instagram and comment on the post that is associated with this episode and give your plant matchmaking recommendations because then that could be like a nice little resource for our community. All right, without further ado, let's dive into interior design trends and houseplant matchmaking with our friend, Betsy. Hi, Betsy. Welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This is so fun. You're my new podcaster friend, and uh, we podcast in very similar but different niches. So I'm very excited to have kind of a more collaborative conversation today instead of like a formal interview that I normally do. Agreed. Because just as I'm leaving a client's house after we finish an interior design session, they say, oh, 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 Betsy, wait, what about plants? And Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know. (laughs) So I'm so glad that we've run into each other in the podcast universe because I need some plant help for sure. And I need design help. So we really, (laughs) we are a match made in heaven. And you know, it's interesting because I think plant parents, obviously we're all obsessed with houseplants or gardening. So we're obsessed with design in some way, right? I personally don't know anything about interior design. I'm very excited for this conversation because I feel like my design style is plants. Like I don't really care about my couch. I really just care about the green wall that's above my couch. And I feel like I have kind of a very chaotic style because of that. Also, I've completely lost touch with my personal interior design style because I've been living in furnished rentals for over the last year. So I'm excited to kind of have this conversation and get excited to kind of dream about our next home with you. But I think any plant parent 
obviously is going to be excited about learning more about interior design because we're designing with plants in our own way, but we might not be designing with our couches and our frames and all of those other things. So I'm excited to pick your brain a little bit. Well, you don't want it to look like you're living inside a terrarium, right? You need it to look like a home that has plants woven in in a really creative and cohesive way. So sometimes I just see these corners in people's homes that are just filled with plants. They don't know how to disperse them. They don't know what plants would work well in which light. So they just put them all by the window and there's like plant zone versus having it nicely distributed throughout the space so that they almost become small organic sculptures versus, you know, just this living, breathing corner. Yeah. Well, and I will say, I mean, I'm someone who would totally argue to have a plant corner because I had a restorative planty nook near my window that had a beautiful blue velvet chair and it had some shelving and I would go and I would read there. I would like spend free screen free time there. But I think you draw an important delineation between a beautifully designed nook. And if that's with a lot of plants, great. And if it's without great, but there's a difference between curated and intentional and then just cluttered and hoarders. Right. And I feel like with people in the plant space, sometimes we're so preoccupied with the plants that we don't think about the ratio of space and plants and books and shelving and the distribution, just like you said. So, you know, I feel like the thing with interior design is I feel like it can be kind of intimidating. You have to have taste when it comes to interior design. You have to have style. You have to know what your aesthetic is. And for someone like me who really doesn't know much about it, it's really intimidating to the point where it makes me almost like scared to learn. So Betsy, before we dive in, I'd love for you to just briefly introduce yourself to our listener community. You host an amazing interior design podcast. How'd you become the interior designer you are today? Yes. Well, my name is Betsy Helmuth. I'm so glad to be here. I host Affordable Interior Design, the podcast, and I can't wait to have you on as my guest in just a few short weeks. Uh, So I got into interior design in a very circuitous route. I actually started as a painter, creating paintings for people's apartments in New York City. But on in the background, as I was painting, I would watch interior design shows, Mm -hmm. HGTV, HGTV. TLC, when they had trading spaces and all that great stuff while you were out. And so it would just be going on in the background as I'm painting and thinking about this person's home. Like, what colors can I use in the painting to bring out, you know, the richness of the leather armchair or their vast collection of books? How can I really make this painting sing in this environment? Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I'm being programmed (laughs) subconsciously by all this TV. And so living in New York City, I was like, how can I combine this artistic passion with something that could make more money? And one of the people I was watching on TV was Tom Felicia from Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Mm -hmm. And I just wrote to him and was like, hey, I would like to learn more about interior design. I see you have a shop here in New York City. Can I be an intern? (laughs) Wow. And I submitted my painting portfolio and the rest is history. I worked with him for a year at his firm. And decided that I loved interior design, but I was working for his high-end clientele Mm -hmm. and I really couldn't um, relate to people who were celebrities or who had $20,000 to spend on a couch. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Missouri. I grew up very poor, humble roots. And, you know, that wouldn't fit in my trailer. So I don't think it's going to work, you know, for my clients in small apartments. So I was just finding ways to translate his amazing aesthetic to things that people could afford. Target, Ikea, Crate and Barrel. And that's where my love of design and ultimately my podcast and business were born. Yeah. I think that's interesting. You bring that up because I do feel like interior design can feel really intimidating to people. And for me personally, definitely, I feel like, you know, you have to have a certain level of taste and you do have to have a really expensive couch. And if you can't have those things, then like you're bad at interior design. Is that why you think that it's intimidating to people? Cause I feel like people either love it or are kind of intimidated. I think a lot of people are intimidated. And I think One of the reasons they're intimidated is because there's a lot at stake. There's a lot of money on the line. Buying a couch, buying new artwork, buying rugs, it's an investment. And you can easily make the wrong choice and have a sectional that's way too big for the room. And all of a sudden, the room just isn't working. 
I think that's the first thing. And then I think the second thing that I hear a lot when clients call or when people write into the show is that they feel like they should be able to do it. We almost have an expectation that style is innate. And I'm here to tell you it's not, right? And so they feel a lot of shame that they couldn't do it themselves. You know, they grew up in a home. They've been to other people's homes. They should know how to do this. They're successful in other areas of their life. They know what they don't like, right? Mm -hmm. So they have a clear sensibility, but they just don't know how to put it together. They don't know that there's rules and proportions and measurements that have to be followed. Oh my God. I feel like you just spoke to my heart, to my core. I also feel like too, being a woman and feeling like you're supposed to be a homemaker and you're supposed to be able to do this. I fell into plants because I had moved in with my husband, my then boyfriend, and plants were my way of nesting in my home because we were living in a lot of Billy's stuff. He he had a whole apartment that we basically moved into and plants were my way of nesting and like bringing some life into the space. Even if I didn't have design style, I felt like it was my way to like contribute and nest and create a space. And I think what 2020 definitely highlighted for people in 2021, what I am very much feeling right now after living in these furnished homes for over a year too, is your space is so important. Like having a comfortable home to unwind in. And I feel like that's also why plants are so important to people is they feel like their plants are these living, breathing things that they care of and they're in their home and they come home to their plants, you know, and it's this very comforting thing. And I think design and make creating a space that you're comfortable in to unwind in whatever it looks like for you, whether it's super modern, elegant, clean, minimal lines, or whether it's like jungle fever, you know, like colors everywhere, whatever it looks like. I do feel like it's, it's never been more important to kind of create something that's cozy and comfortable for yourself. Well, and while you were talking, I was thinking about it. You know, I think we do like plants because we nurture them. We see the payoff of our hard work in their growth. And I think that same characteristic of nurturing takes place in our homes. You know, my home gets messy. I have two kids running around, but fluffing the pillows at the end of the day or before company comes, folding the throw blankets, Mm -hmm. you know, organizing the bookshelf, just so styling the top of the piano with just the right thing for the holidays. That's that same sort of nurturing attention and ownership. Yeah. And kind of seeing that result when people come over and say, wow, or when you just feel really good about your space and are able to unwind in that chair in your plant nook, Mm -hmm. right there, that's the payoff, but it's that same nurturing chip just directed in slightly different ways. No, totally. I definitely feel the same sense of failure when my plants die. (laughs) (laughs) I thought I did everything right. I don't know what I'm doing. I should be able to do this. No, it's, it's totally true. I mean, a lot of people have such shame over being plant killers because they think that they should know, but you don't know what you don't know. And in society these days, we don't get raised with plant care and, you know, in, in high school or middle school and certainly not with design. Um, and I also feel like design is something as you grow older, you notice more like, you know, you don't notice you know, your parents touches in your childhood home or, or, you know, when you go to other people's houses, but now all of a sudden it's like, wherever I go, I'm looking at the the art on the walls and how, you know, the window treatments and, and all that kind of stuff. So can we start? So I'm so excited. We're going to play matchmaker today. You and me are match our matchmaking team. And we're going to talk about different, the most popular design styles. You and I kind of huddled about what we fig- what we found like the most popular ones were. You're going to give tips and tricks on how to break down each design style. And I'm going to match some plant suggestions. So at the end of it, we're going to have so much fun content at the end of this conversation. But before we dive in, for those of us who maybe are a little nervous about interior designing, you're mentioning the the um, proportions, the, the tips, the tricks, the knowledge that we might not have, basic interior design tips. Can we start there? Of course. Yeah. So there's so many tips that it can be overwhelming. But the first thing is don't be afraid to go big. You know, so many people buy lots of little pieces of furniture because they're afraid that something may not fit or it may be overwhelming, but then they buy one small shelf that holds some of the books, but not all the books. So then they have to get another small shelf that holds some of the books, but not all the books. And then they find themselves getting a large bookcase. And now the space is just cluttered with pieces, none of which are doing the full job. Same thing with a couch. People will get like a small love seat 
because they're afraid of getting anything too big because it'll overwhelm the space. But then they need another love seat and some more chairs and a chaise. And by the time they do all of that, the space is so cluttered or they get small rugs, right? Like a little rug under the coffee table and then a little rug under the pair of chairs and a little rug over there by the entryway. And there's so many little rugs that it's visually cluttered and not really showing the space to its full advantage. So Mm. look at your space, just like if you were dressing yourself, you would look at your body. What do I want to accentuate? And what do I want to conceal, right? If I have really high ceilings, I want to make sure to incorporate really tall things so that I draw people's eye up to what's amazing. And if I have floors and I don't really like the stain, it just doesn't coordinate with my style, but I want to conceal that, then use a large rug, right? So just think about things you want to highlight. I love highlighting windows because it's like art that you don't have to buy. So you want to flank that with beautiful drapes and make sure that those drapes touch the floor. We don't want any cropped curtains unless we're designing some kind of country kitchen. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different tips for lots of different elements, which I think is also why it can be overwhelming. There's so much to know. Mm -hmm. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. What about, I've heard people talk about the rule of three when it comes to design. Is that a thing? It is. It's definitely, I don't call it the rule of three. What I call it is not using a lot of even numbers. So odd numbers feel more natural to us. They're more organic to the eye. In fact, a lot of it crosses over into plant life. When you look at like a maple leaf or whatever, it generally has an odd number of points versus an even, right? We're used to three leaf clovers and four leaf clovers are very rare, right? So odd numbers feel more organic and natural to us. So I avoid too many pairs of two. So many people are really addicted to like two floating shelves, two armchairs, just two, 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 like two pieces of art that fit together, but it can look a little like Noah's Ark. You really want to avoid the trap of two. So I like one, three, five, or seven. I don't stick with only three, by the way. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's totally true. The odd number thing. Okay. So that's more about proportions when designing something. When I'm layering out like a gallery wall, you know, I'll make sure that I have an odd number of frames, not an even number. If I want it to look kind of haphazard, like it just happened naturally. Like I just have style and wasn't trying too hard. Right. So matchy matchy. That's right. That's right. So it just doesn't feel as easy. So something in the plant that I, this just popped into my head, something in the plant world that is so popular is a shelfie, a plant shelfie. (laughs) <laughs> um, which is a selfie of your shelf and people in the plant world style. I think, I mean, I think shelfies are, are outside of the plant world, but they're like beautifully curated bookshelves that have plants and little knickknacks and books. And sometimes the books are like color coordinated. Do you have any tips for like how to design a beautiful bookshelf? Cause I feel like a lot of plant people like live for that cascading philodendron or pothos, you know, tumbling down the side of a bookshelf. Do you have any tips for, I feel like that's a moment where I still haven't figured out proportions. Yes. I think it's tricky because, you know, on the shelves themselves, unless you have a really eclectic look, I personally don't love the plant to spill over the shelves. 
So you have to find something that kind of is tight and will stay tight, right? That's not going to grow and become too overwhelming or that you can prune. Now, I love a plant that goes down the side if it's on top of the bookshelf. So don't ignore the tops of the bookshelves because that can be a really great way to add some flowing lines with that ivy. I don't even know the words for those plants, by the way. Yeah, you can uh, call it whatever. ivy. Yeah, philodendron, pothos, whatever. <laughs> whatever grows and drapes and keeps cascading, like you said, I love that on the top. I don't necessarily love it in the middle shelves. So, okay, I love that. I love a plant tumbling down the top of a bookshelf along the side. I think it looks so cool. So what about the symmetry and also the balance of like how many books to how many just other items, because I feel like a plant shelfie or just a shelfie is like all about what is in a book on the bookshelf. Do you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Definitely. Yes. And I think one thing to consider is where is the bookshelf? If the bookshelf is in a dining room, then I want to adorn it with things that would be found in a dining room, whether it's cookbooks, teacups and saucers on little display um, easels, or maybe even I'll style a couple of shelves like a bar, right? If the bookcase is in the bedroom, I want to be cognizant of what's on there. It needs to be restful pictures mixed with some plants, mixed with some books that have good restful energy. I don't want any school textbooks. I don't want anything about managing your finances. I want, you know, vacation novels, beach reads. So you really want to curate the bookcase depending on what room you're in and what vibe you're going for. That being said, I love bookends. I, of course, love plants. Um, I love picture frames. I love, you know, small things from travels. Love that. But you want to make sure you don't get too small because anything under four inches high can just look like visual clutter. It can be hard to have it read in a picture. So when you're creating that amazing shelfie, if it's the two inch tall figurine, it's not going to read. It's just going to look like when a shelf is normally like 12 to 16 inches tall. That's right. So four inches is kind of my minimum height for an accessory on a shelf. I love that. That's a great tip. What about uh, books? I see people having books normally vertical, stacked normal with bookends. But then I also see people who like put the books horizontal and stack them on top of each other for a different look. How do you, what do you think looks the best? Yes and yes. Both those things look amazing. The thing I do not personally like, I do not personally like when they flip the book around and you only see the pages. And the reason I don't personally like that is it looks like you have something to hide. Like, why won't you let me see the subject matter? (laughs) So that's the only reason I don't love that look. Also, when I am styling a bookcase, I think about putting like dense sections of books on the bottom. So you want to think about gravity, like heavier things on the bottom, getting lighter up top, but not so light that it fades away. You need some balance from top to bottom, but overall the heavier things, whether they're bulky baskets or shelf to shelf books, kind of that end to end situation that typically goes on the bottom for me. Okay. I love the way color blocking looks on bookshelves, but I hate how impractical it is for when you have to find the books. Like I like grouping my books together in terms of their purpose, but then I'm like, oh, I love the color blocking. Do you aim towards one? Is color blocking still in? I know it was in like a couple of years ago. Personally, I don't color block. And the reason is because, you know, my clients are typically on a budget. They're not going to buy books for this project. I'm using books they have. And when you take off the book jackets, which you should, if you're accessorizing a bookcase, I remove every dust jacket. Really? Yes. And I throw them away. My clients are like, where do you put these dust jackets, Betsy? And I'm like, in the trash can. Oh, look cute. They look frayed. It's not a good look. Okay. So you remove all of those, but oftentimes the spines are not that colorful. The majority of the spines are just gray or blue, that dark blue. Yeah. Brown. Yes. So it's very hard to actually achieve without buying new books. So I prefer to go in ascending and descending order. That's my must. In fact, when I married my husband, we moved in together And I, of course, styled every bookcase and he had a ton of books. Well, I was so proud of my work. He comes home and I show off my bookshelf. This was before there were shelfies. So I just showed it to him (laughs) and he was appalled. 
I had ruined all of his order. Like all the Steve Martin books have to go together. He's and like all me. The, yes. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? That looks horrible. So I don't care a lick about subject matter unless, you know, it's going to impact the restfulness of the room. Like I don't want somebody's grad school books across from their queen bed. Right. But it needs to have like a rhythm and flow. It can't just be high book, low book, high book, low book. Oh no. So when you say ascending order, you mean height going from the tallest to the shortest. That's right. Or vice versa. And I will mix it up a little bit. Like I'll have it undulate on the same shelf. So it's not always like a pyramid, Yeah. but it needs to really go based on the height and thickness of the book. Interesting. I can't play by the color rules because people just don't have a lot of red and orange and purple books. Yeah. No. Yeah. This is why I'm terrible at interior design. I'm like your husband. I'm like, no, I need all of my gardening books in this section. I need all of my business books over here. So whenever I need a book, I can go get it. Uh, But also I have so many gardening books and most of their jackets are green that I do think it would be cool to have a whole green shelf. But anyway, okay. Yes. You could do like dark green to light green. And the other, you know, the way I compromised with my husband is now he just has his own room with all of his books. And then (laughs) I style the rest of the house. Totally. (laughs) So I don't even, see we'll talk about this on your show, but cause we're talking about lighting on your show, but, um, the coolest thing I ever did to my bookshelf was I installed a grow light in one of the shelves. And then I filled one shelf just with plants because it was like a little, almost terrarium. And then the shelf above it and the shelf below it was books. And it was just like a very kind of cool, like pattern interrupt moment, which I loved. I love it. But how do you prevent the plants from like overgrowing their boundary on the shelf? Um, You prune them back or I liked the look of a plant tumbling out. So I had this one geranium that wouldn't stop blooming under the grow lights. And I just had red blooms like tumbling out of my bookshelf every day. So I kind of enjoyed that more wild look, but you could certainly prune them back or you could choose smaller plants. Like I had a grow light so I could have like highlight succulents or like smaller stuff that, you know, I kind of rotated. Okay. So let's move into the matchmaking portion of our conversation. I'm so excited because it's like, you've got the interior smart, the design smarts. I've got the plant smarts. We're going to be a match made in heaven because so many people design without understanding plant needs in mind. And then they've got dead plants, which is always such a bummer. So I'm going to give you different design styles, and then you're going to kind of break down what they are. We'll talk about some tips and then we'll do some matchmaking. I think we have to start with boho, or I guess that's short for bohemian, right? Love it. That's right. So I, I have to say shout out to Justina Blankenly of the Jungle I'm absolutely obsessed with her and everything she does. I feel like the Jungle is kind of its own thing now, but it's definitely, it's born of that kind of boho vibe. And I just feel like plants are so integral to the style. So can you just talk about kind of the high level of what the style actually means? Definitely. Well, bohemian, you know, when we're talking about visual references would be things that do not feel matchy matchy at all. Perhaps they even came from different countries, world travels. A lot of them need to feel either hand hewn, like, you know, metals that were hammered or silks that are raw or, um, you know, macrame that's loomed, something that feels like not only is it from a different place, it was made by someone who's from that other world, right? Oftentimes the fabrics are embellished with beads or sequins. Uh, Typically the fabrics are very rich, silks, velvets, things that look sumptuous and decadent. And, you know, I typically think of Bohemian as having lots of different patterns that seamlessly work together, even though they look like they came from totally different lands as well as those rich jewel tone colors. Mm. So deep purples, magentas, burgundies, emeralds, all of those things come to mind when I am designing boho. I love that. So if I knew that boho was my aesthetic or what I wanted it to be, but I didn't know how to effectively mismatch, but match different patterns that must, I feel like that's a whole art in itself because you have this collection of different, you know, patterns and rugs that seemingly, like you said, don't match, but they actually look really good together. So how do you execute that? 
Yes, that is the trick because with boho, it can look very scattered, almost too eclectic, almost too flatter object. Yeah. Like, are we in a curiosity shop or is this someone's well curated home? So I have a rule of thumb for that whenever I'm mixing patterns. So you want to start with a core color palette. So I take an inspiration piece, like a piece of art or like that very vibrant rug you were talking about that has three colors or more. And then you can pull colors from that for all the patterns. So all the patterns coordinate with that rug, but here's the trick. All the patterns must be a different scale. So they can't all be tiny patterns, right? They can't all be large patterns and you measure a pattern from its repeat. So from the start of the pattern to where it repeats again is the size of the pattern. Okay. So small polka dots, right? We have little trellis patterns. We have large damask patterns. We have even larger floral patterns, right? So as long as they all coordinate with that one inspiration piece, and as long as each pattern that you've chosen, whether it's the throw pillow, the rug, the drapes, the throw blanket are of a different scale, it will seamlessly work together. It's when you have a whole bunch of tiny patterns that it's like, what's going on that don't relate to anything that shares the color palette, or when you have a lot of huge patterns, right. That can feel so overwhelming and totally that's when it starts to look like you didn't know what you were doing. You're blowing my mind right now. So you use that one base pattern as the color anchor, and then you can have another pattern as long as the color aligns with whatever the rug or the art, you know, whatever your anchor pattern is. And that's so interesting about the scale, because I feel like a lot of smaller patterns actually are just going to be busy and overwhelming, but a larger pattern and a smaller or large scale, and then a small scale mixing together. See, I don't know any of this stuff. That's awesome. You you know, I distill design down to rules. They're rules I follow every day. You know, I watched Tom Felicia design and I was like, how can I turn this into something that I can do that I can replicate. And it's all rules, you know, look through design magazines. You're not going to see a room with a ton of tiny patterns, but each pattern is going to relate back to what I call that inspiration piece, whether it is that big piece of art above the sofa or that magnificent rug on the floor, it's got the multicolors from which we derive the colors for the patterns. And then you can go nuts. You can truly pick as many patterns as you want. And in the boho style, I think you have to have at least three patterns in the room. Or else you're not really embracing the nature of the style. I also think something interesting with boho and also definitely junglo and something I've been playing around with myself is thinking that you can only have one bright color in a room because then it's going to be too overwhelming. But I actually think with the boho, you actually need a couple of bright colors almost combating each other because it actually mellows everybody out. Mm. Does that make sense? To you? I think that's an interesting philosophy. I've never thought of it that way. And it totally makes sense. I always think that you need three colors, right? Three so co- okay. you have a base of neutrals, mm-hmm. so whether it's grays, beiges, you know, off whites or grayges, right? So you start with the foundation of neutrals and then you overlay color. But the way that you work with color well is, in my opinion, you only pick three colors from that inspiration piece, right? So if it's the magenta, the navy, and the yellow ochre, all of those are perfect boho colors, by the way. So you're pulling those from the inspiration piece and you're sprinkling them around the room, but using them in different doses. So I'd use 60% magenta, 30% of my accents and accessories and colorful items would be navy. And I do 10% pops of that ochre. Now, if you wanted to go more colorful, if you want to push it in a style like boho, that would make sense. That 10% I was referring to mm-hmm. could be any color found in the inspiration piece. Okay. So you can go a little bit wild, but only in a small dose because we want at the end of the day, it to feel sophisticated and sometimes boho because there's so many different ideas that pieces are coming from so many different sources, so many different countries. Sometimes it can feel all over the place. Mm -hmm. So when you're shopping, you really need to have an editing eye and stick to rules with a style like boho with an eclectic style, because otherwise it's going to look just like a big mishmash. Yeah. You have a personality test on your website that I took because I, I, similar to my plant parent personality, but it's your design. So I took it and I'm in a, I got eclectic. Oh yeah. You got to watch it out. I got to watch out. Who like boho and eclectic need to work with a professional. 
Yeah. Because it can get all over the place so fast. Uh, with other styles that we'll talk about, I think you can really put your own guardrails on. But with eclectic, the more fun you have in a sophisticated, um, boundaryed way, the more wow your space will have. People will come in and they'll say, oh my gosh, this is so you. This could not be anyone else but right. you. Totally. But it can go wrong quickly. <laughs> the other thing yeah. I love about eclectic and both, because I guess we can kind of lap them together, is... um texture. So how do you approach, because if you think about boho, you're thinking about macrame, which is huge in the plant space. And when we start matchmaking, that'll be the first thing I bring up, but how do you mix and match texture effectively? Every style needs mix and match textures. So you want to be thinking about using different elements in the room. So if I've used a lot of fabrics and upholstery, very soft things, right? I need to bring in some hard things. Like I need to bring in that hammered metal surface that I was referring to, Mm. or I need to bring in some wood. And in boho, we want to see the wood grain. We almost want to see like a patina that it's been aged or, you know. Like a terracotta. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we want to think about using different textures throughout the space in any style, but you want to think about textures that are innate to that style. Like woven rattan can fit in beautifully in boho. Mm, Yeah. But of course it works really well in farmhouse as well. So every room needs lots of layers of texture. Thank you to our episode sponsors, Espoma Organics and Territorial Seed Company. Espoma Organic is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. We know I love Espoma and their liquid fertilizers, especially the houseplant-specific one that I always use in when I water my plants. And I love their potting mixes and my Lazy Girl DIY potting mix I do all the time now. But did you know they have amazing seed starting mix? So if you're interested in starting seeds this year, tis the season, as we're in January, as this episode releases, you should totally grab a bag of their seed starting mix before you check out at the garden center. Set you, your garden, and your seeds up for success by trying it. And once you've gotten your plant out of those seedling pots and into your garden outdoors, they have a ton of outdoor products for outdoor gardeners like their Biotone Starter, plus their plant tone and their plant-specific fertilizer. So to learn more about all of the amazing indoor and outdoor plant products that Espoma has, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link in the show notes to visit my Bloom & Grow Espoma Amazon storefront for a curated list of my Espoma faves. Plant friends, if you are excited to get growing this season, you've got to check out my friends at Territorial Seed Company. From artichoke to zucchini, they have everything you need to grow your best garden this year. I loved growing all sorts of interesting seeds that I got on the Territorial Seed Company website last year. Seeds and varietals that you could never find in your local garden center. It is so much fun to have such control over what you grow in your garden. It makes planning that much more fun. Plus, Territorial Seed Company has over 40 years experience making sure that their seeds and plants are the highest quality you could trust. They are offering an exclusive discount just for Bloom and Grow listeners for 10% off at checkout with code GROW10. So head to territorialseed.com and use code GROW10 to get 10% off your seeds and plants for your garden this year. All right, back to Betsy. I love it. Well, this is a perfect stepping off point for matchmaking for plants. I feel like boho and eclectic, many plants work because so many things could work as long as you have that lens. I feel like we'll say Monstera for everything, but like Monstera is a classic, you know, boho, jungle, eclectic thing. Also, I feel like larger statement plants could be really interesting because you said like emerald is such a big color. Um, Having like a beautiful, large bird of paradise could be really cool. The other thing that comes to mind with boho and plants is just, you got to have some macrame hangers, right? Or some macrame wall, you know, wall pieces, but plant hangers in macrame. And also I feel like terracotta being like such a beautiful, warm tone with that beautiful patina could look really cool. Mm -hmm. It's all about the planter. And I think it would be all about plants that look like they come from exotic locales. So I love that. Also, I was going to say colorful plants could be cool. 
to kind of tie in, like there's a philodendron pink princess, which is a plant that has pink and green leaves. That could be really cool plants with really cool patterns. Like maybe that, maybe a plant pattern of a leaf could be one of the three patterns that you talk about um, with Marantaceae, you know, the prayer plants or something like that. So that's a cool, that's a cool place to start. I feel like for the matchmaking, our, our plant friends at home listening are probably gonna have the least problem pairing plants for the style. So let's move, let's move on to the next, but that's, that was so fun. So, okay. You and I had a conversation offline about this because I, I don't understand anything about interior design. So let's dive into the modern versus contemporary debate. These are apparently two different styles that I have been referring to as one style for a while. So can you kind of break down what those are? And we had some listeners write in asking about minimalist aesthetics and plants, which I feel like can get really hard for plant parents who want 5 billion plants. So I feel like this is kind of that umbrella, but could you kind of dive in and explain the similarities and differences? Of course. Yes. So people use modern and contemporary interchangeably Mm -hmm. and I don't blame them, right? Modern feels like what's happening now, but it's not. Modern refers to an era in the 1930s when things were becoming industrialized. So it actually spanned from the early 1900s to 1930 as we were building machines and fabricating new textures. We didn't have to rely on things that were natural anymore because all these factories were producing all these industrialized things. People were using finishes that did not look like they came from nature. So they were using a lot of lacquer, a lot of polished pieces, geometric shapes. They were keeping everything super minimal. It's very austere and it's very hard to live in. You know, you can't be cluttered and live in a modern space that refers to that era. Whereas contemporary refers to what's happening now, whatever is popular now. So contemporary is a word that we're going to be using to define spaces for hundreds of years to come. Contemporary is what's now. And if you're wondering what is now, Betsy, uh, now what is popular are clean lines. Mm -hmm. Pops of color. So that foundation of neutrals I was talking about with those pops so that it doesn't feel overly colorful. Uh, Simple shapes. People don't want a lot of ornate carving. That's more of that traditional style. People are looking for things that feel comfortable, that are family friendly. They don't want to have that formal living room as separate from the family room. They want a room that people feel comfortable in no matter which space it is in their home. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's what's happening now in interior design. Every space is lived in. There's no, you know, we don't touch this. There's no sitting room. Yeah. Right, right. And sort of looking for those very detailed furniture pieces has gone by the wayside and people are looking for simple, clean statements. Yeah, totally. And then where does minimalist fall in there? Well, minimalist is more of that modern style. When people were just really clearing off surfaces, you would not find shelfies or decorated shelves. It would only be very simple pieces. Uh, And so I think a lot of people are drawn towards minimal today, but we're more open to like having baskets for toys. Right. So the contemporary riff on it. Yes, exactly. So I think modern really speaks to true minimalism. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. That, no, <laughs> yeah, nothing. You will not have to dust too much. I mean, there'll be surfaces and it's highly lacquered and bold primary colors. If there is color, it's a lot of black and white. Again, things that don't look natural. Right. So let's focus on, which I feel like that doesn't sound as popular as obviously contemporary, which sounds super popular. Clean lines, I feel like is something I hear people talking about all the time. So what if I what if I have a lot of stuff and I want clean lines and what if I have, and I want plants and I want the clean line, the calm, I feel like clean lines evokes calm, right? Like having just control and calm over my space, but I want, but maybe I have a lot of plants or I have a lot of stuff. Like what would be tips that you would suggest to someone to kind of effectively have clean lines, but in this livable, more livable way? I've got one word for you. Just one word. Okay. Doors, furniture with doors to enclose the clutter, right? Okay. So if I do have like, who doesn't have a bin of cords, right? All the cords for all the game systems, whatever. They put it behind doors. If you want that really clean, nothing is here look, but you still have stuff. 
right? Mm-hmm. You need doors on your furniture, opaque doors, not glass fronts, right? Right. Because glass fronts, I can still see the baskets in there. I can still see the bins in there. And then if, if you don't have doors at all and only shelves, everything is exposed. And of course we can shove stuff in closets, right? To keep all that stuff at bay. But a lot of us live with stuff that we're going to be accessing every day. And so when my clients say they want very clean surfaces and lines, it means I'm finding TV stands with doors not just with open shelving. It means I'm finding a bookcase with doors at the bottom with doors. Yeah. At the bottom. And even like your, you know, coffee table that has storage or something in it as well. That's right. And storage that's completely concealed. So it's not a shelf on the bottom. It's like a drum coffee table, right. With a lift top. Yeah. Things like that, that really make the pieces go away, but the items are still accessible. I can still just lift the top of the coffee table to grab my, you know, decadent throw blanket. Totally. And, um, wow, that's really interesting. Where does color come into play with contemporary right now? You were saying pops of color. Yes. So small, very curated pops. Okay. So people are going for neutral wall paint, maybe just an accent wall. I mean, accent walls were not done 50 years ago, right? This is a very contemporary thing to do. So just pops of color on that neutral foundation, a neutral sofa, gray, beige, beige, within colorful throw pillows that they can switch out when it feels like too much. A lot of clients these days, and you know, I'm taking my cues because the clients lead what's contemporary, frankly, they're telling me what's hot right now is they want to be able to make it more neutral when they want and bring out color when they're ready for that. But yeah. That's interesting from an affordable perspective as well, because say you're going to invest in the big, you know, I feel like a couch, the first time you buy a couch as an adult is like a big moment. It's your first like major investment. I feel like all my friends have gone through this where they're like, I bought my first couch. You know, it's, it was always like a big thing, you know, going from like buying a desk for $200 to like your first couch. And, um, it makes sense to like, keep your larger investments neutral so that they'll over the test of time, you know, they'll stand the test of time and then having smaller things like a throw pillow that can be more affordable, be something that is the pop of color or the trendy thing that can get kind of swapped out. Exactly. Because nowadays people can swap out. You know, even 20 years ago, when I started in this business, a lot of cool things weren't widely available. It was trade only. You had to go through a designer to get the best quality stuff. And now amazing quality things that were only available to the trade before are widely available retail. So people want to try out things. People are watching more HGTV. They Mm -hmm. feel more knowledgeable. They're listening to podcasts, right? And reading books. And they feel armed with a certain level of information that allows them to take some risks. Also, those risks can be affordable. Like Target has amazing stuff. CB2 is my favorite place for trendy items. Yeah. And then I can swap them out at a very low risk. Totally. Totally. And keep them so that as your moods change and your homes change, maybe you want the pillows down the line, or maybe then you move them to the guest room and, you know, everything can kind of circulate and ebb and flow. Oh, I love that. So for matchmaking for this one, clean lines makes me think, clean lines and plants as well. So I think snake plants are no brainer to flank, you know, a bookshelf or to have, you know, as one kind of statement plant with those beautifully structured straight, you know, vertical leaves. I also think maybe going with a one statement plant, if this is kind of more minimal, choosing one or two statement plants. And this is actually a shift that I'm having in my mind going from, I used to have 150 plants to now I have 60 plants. And I'm actually thinking about reducing my plant count again. I'm really fascinated by having just a couple of statement plants that are larger. And it was interesting because you were talking about scale than having like a million smaller plants. So how do you reduce a plant? You like give you- them away or they die. <laughs> I was like, this sounds like murder. Yeah. I lost a lot of plants due to too many moves this year, frankly. And also I gifted a lot of plants away to, to, to different friends and stuff like that, just due to the fact that we were so transient this year. But I would love the idea of like a Raphidophora tetrasperma, which is some people call it a mini monstera, but it has these really structural leaves that vine, you could put a cool trellis on it or some sort of tree. Like I could see like a room 
with really clean lines, nice kind of light, airy feel, and some sort of beautiful tree in the right light. If you have a fiddly fig and you have That's bright what light, they all want. They you can all put want. a fiddly fig in your bright light, or you can get a grow light and hang it on top of it in a very cool modern design. But, you know, or, um, some sort, some sort of other ficus or some sort of bird of paradise or like a large, you know, 12 inch potted plant that can, you know, reach up to six feet. I think that could be really cool. Definitely. I think making that bold statement again, making one large piece versus 20 small pieces can help that clean line feel. Yeah, You don't have to have so many if this one is really drawing attention. Totally. So let's move on. So what about glam? You mentioned this style to me. It's not something I'm actually very familiar with. Talk to me about glam. Glam is glamorous, right? So it used to be known as Hollywood Regency, but when you think old Hollywood, then you're thinking glam. We're thinking mirrored furniture. We're thinking crystals. We're thinking shimmer sequins, you know, white, silver, Again, it doesn't feel very natural, right? But it feels very luxe. Okay. It's dazzling, right? Sometimes, I mean, I hate to genderfy these styles, but it's usually pretty feminine. Okay. Right? When we think about like that amazing vanity table in old Hollywood with the amazing mirror and the shimmering crystal chandelier, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about minimal color, but the colors that are there are typically pretty warm and opulent, rich reds, burgundies, magentas, or like a deep navy, but definitely rich, deep tones or pastel pinks, right? Soft, kind of warm colors. Oh, I love that. I'm trying to think about what matchmaking for glam would be. For me, That what already comes to mind is like, gold planters. Like I'm like, Oh, I feel like glam is all about the planters or pops of something. One thought that came to mind is Hoya because Hoya is a genus. Number one, the leaves are really beautiful. They can be compact plants that grow very lush. You can trellis them. You can have them as trailing plants, but they, they, many of them have unbelievable flowers that are scented. They feel luxurious. They're also like the hot plant right now. So that kind of makes me think if it's like luxurious, like that's kind of where everybody's going, but they are called the wax plant because their flowers are so beautiful. They look like they're cut out of wax and many of them are light pink actually. So that could kind of be interesting. Glam. I feel like also you could have some pretty epic statement plants within a glam bedroom or a glam living room. Well, and when I think glam, I mean, I don't know how this coincides with plants, but I think like roses, so many cut roses in a crystal vase. Oh, okay. So cut flowers. We can say yes. cut flowers. Absolutely. Okay, we can say that. Can we say that? I'm not Absolutely. Growing? Also, maybe if you're, if you have a glam interior house, maybe you want to grow some roses in your front yard so you can always be cutting or peonies, you know, so you can be cutting and. Oh yes. A peony. Yeah. And always having, I bet cut flower gardeners who like to grow their own flowers would love a glam interior that they can always have, you know, beautiful vases that they're swapping out. Definitely. And I think the challenging part of this style for me, you know, I own affordable interior design, right? And this needs to cost some money or else it looks a little bit cheap, right? So think of cheap mirrored furniture that you can kind of see the seams. It's not quite touching. You can see the wood underneath. You really have to pony up. Mm -hmm. in terms of spending money so that it looks authentically luxe versus having plastic crystals, things like that. (laughs) Plastic crystals. Yikes. (laughs) Um, yeah. So maybe that's another thing where it's like you invest in a couple of pieces and then kind of let the rest of it be neutral and kind of speak for itself. That's interesting. I'm curious about the beach coastal vibe. So one of my favorite design shows that I watch is I think it's called my dream home makeover, but it's Studio McGee. Do you know who that is? Of course. Yeah. She's coastal, right? That's her. I think of her as almost a coastal and farmhouse mix. Yeah. There's I'm a obsessed lot with her. of farmhouse. Nope. I, I think it's trendy and will be a flash in the pan, much like oh, farmhouse. You do? It's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I actually follow her on Facebook. I'm a big Facebook group fan. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think it's going to have its moment. Okay. That's I think fair. it's having its moment. 
It's definitely, yeah, she, it's definitely having its moment. It's great, fun TV show, fun to watch, especially for me, who's someone who just doesn't understand design at all. It's just like fun to watch these houses come to life. Anything HGTV I'll watch. I love it. I love it all. So yeah. So talk to me about coastal beach vibes. So people love coastal and beach, especially right now when the world can be so overwhelming and dizzying. It's very relaxing. I do think it's a little goofy to have a coastal or beach design if you don't live in a coastal or beach atmosphere. I'm from Missouri, and unless we had a lake house, I don't think it's appropriate. So I think you need to be by a body of natural water (laughs) in order to embrace this style. Uh, But, you know, it definitely has a lot of amazing textures, whether it's shells, bone inlay, uh, rattan, wicker, driftwood, whitewashed wood. You know, we're definitely not going for saturated colors, all muted tones, but you don't have to stick with blues and seafoam greens. Right. It's not so on the nose. It's not, it's not the home is at the beach sign. It's not that. Right. Right. Exactly. It's with the colors and the feel and the textures you choose. And it doesn't have to be with the imagery that you choose. So I don't love seeing a big picture of a seashell. I don't love seeing like a mosaic of fish and water. You know, you want to kind of create the ambiance without visually hammering at home. So that's why I love to use butter yellow, a warm coral, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of going for stark white, I might go for like an ivory that's an linen kind of Mm. color okay? so that it has that almost rustic kind of washed up. Sand for sure. Yeah. Yes. It looks and that like color sand. of beige. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I avoid those really austere grays that almost lend themselves to blue in a beachy environment because it's not an organic color. You know, um, it's kind of that industrial type gray. So we want to go for more of those. What would really be found at the beach? Beach glass, right? Um, how can we incorporate lighting in just the right way so it feels sun kissed in here? Mm. That's so beautiful. All, all things are about evoking that feeling rather than showing people what the beach is. Totally. I'm like more relaxed. I'm relaxed just hearing you talk about it. Yes, <laughs> I, know. I love the texture though. And also, so my mom just moved to Florida from spending her whole life in the Northeast with a very, they lived in a Tudor. They had a very old school, I don't know, traditional style. I don't even know what their style is, but like all old antique wood and beautiful wooden, you know, dining tables and wood chairs, ornate for sure. And it's interesting watching them move to Florida. They got this house with floor to ceiling windows that's white with views of palm trees. And all of a sudden everything is, my mom's amazing. She's an amazing designer, but um, she pulls the colors of the ocean without having pictures of the ocean in such a beautiful way, like having the earth tone, like the, the inspiration being nautical or beach or whatever, but not having it be so on the nose is really cool and hard. It's a, it's hard, but well, it's, cool. it's easy to go for the big picture of the ship, right? These are easy things, the which way to the beach sign, right? That you can find everywhere. So you have to think sophisticated. You have to curate, you have to choose to not include those items and find a different way besides the big anchor on the wall, right? What does the anchor make you feel? You know, how can we evoke that in like a Navy nautical stripe in the sheets and the guest room versus having little anchors on the sheets, right? That's so funny. I was just thinking stripes, right? Like how do you have a pop of stripes, which is such a nautical feel. So for plants, for matchmaking here, for some reason, the visual that I just have is like, what can like blow in the wind and look really beautiful? (laughs) I don't know if that even makes sense, but for me, like palms, anything with like lacy leaves that you can kind of see swaying in the wind, kind of giving you that, transporting you to that kind of tropical vibe. Palms would be really beautiful. A par- a large parlor palm. Also, if you have the light, this is where succulents are going to shine in a really beautiful way to do some sort of like succulent arrangement on, you know, a table or, or succulents on your windowsill. Also, I could see like, I mean, what else is by the beach? That's really interesting that you could. Well, my neighbors, even though we're not by the beach, they have like this amazing seagrass, you know, yeah, just like and it's a little unruly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So sometimes um, right at the end of the season, we have to cut it. They cut it just down to the 
bottom. And so I take some and put it in vases. Yeah. I was thinking that like some grassy, and now I feel like they're such beautiful dried grasses, dried grasses and dried plants are kind of having a moment. I know in the floral industry too. So doing that, those kind of statement pieces in like a beautiful, clear, you know, clear glass vase, which is kind of reminiscent of sea glass. And then having some sort of beautiful structural, you know, dried grass of sorts could be really beautiful. Also scented like lavender could be really beautiful. Um, if you're kind of having that, like relaxing, I'm just trying to think about like the sense of like being with those being... purple flowers. I think that's perfect. You know, bringing in an unexpected tone that's still very yeah. light and Soft. muted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also tropical. This is obviously like anything tropical foliage is going to look nice with a beach, which is obviously normally going to be a little bit more tropical. So whatever that means to you, bird of paradise, monstera, cool philodendrons could also be really interesting, but I love that. I love that. I'm like, I, when I see my parents' house, I'm like, gosh, I need to move down to Florida too. I need to move to the sun. Okay. Now let's talk about it was, it started with Miss Joanna Gaines, my idol, and now it's kind of coming again in a new, new iteration with Studio McGee, but this rustic farmhouse slash modern, I mean, farmhouse is such a moment in, you know, the last five years. Um, I've, and I adore both of those women. Um, so this also though, I feel like like you kind of mentioned with glam, I feel like it can look really cool and curated, or it can look really kitschy. You don't want it to look like you're actually in a barn. Yes. Right. So how do you walk that line? So how, how would you describe the style and how, what would your beginner tips be? Well, it's definitely rustic, right? So the pieces should not look too new. They should look a little hand hewn. They should be, you know, the thing that separates this style from rustic, which was popular maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is that this has a level of comfortability. Sometimes rustic can feel hard or uninviting. This has to have some charm. So we're thinking of like farmhouse meets cozy, comfy, charm, big overstuffed sofa with rolled arms in white, Mm -hmm. right? With a very neutral color palette, not a lot of bright colors, Mm -hmm. really relying on the actual materials to shine, whether it's burlap or that open weave linen or, you know, that rustic wood where you can see the grain for sure. Even if you're whitewashing it to get that white effect, you want to see the wood grain. You don't Mm -hmm. want it to completely go away. You want to see that dark metal hardware, the hand hewn burnished sort of pull on the big closet door, right? Yeah. So again, it can't feel too perfect. It can't feel too clean and polished like we would see in modern interior design with nothing you would see a fingerprint or anything like that. This, you want to see those slight imperfections, those things that make it feel original, unique. I love that. Yeah. And it's, it's cozy. It's next level cozy. It needs to feel like you could cuddle up in any corner with a big chunky blanket and read that book. So what, because this is also one where I feel like could get cluttered with like little, like, you know, weird, like balls you put in like next to the books in the bookshelf and, you know, like all the weird little trinkets, tchotchkes. Um, What do you feel like are like the big moments that farmhouse, every farmhouse style should have? You mentioned like the big plush couch, obviously blankets. Yes. All the, bl- everybody should always have blanket. Always. No matter what style. Yes. Except for modern. I don't think you get a blanket. Yeah. Modern. Or I you better be so. putting that away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What are the other like signature kind of rustic moments? In my mind, you do need texture on the walls. You can't just have a plain white wall. So whether it's the ship lap, whether it's- Oh, ship lap. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. And then I think you also need some kind of big sculptural decor. So rather than relying on framed art, you need like the big wheel or the big tapestry or the big something that feels sculptural and 3D versus- Oh, or the big statement plant. There we go. There you could go. have a big plant. Maybe this is a moment for like some kind of evergreen inside. Is that a thing? Um, 
Evergreens would be hard. Uh, well, but I, it's interesting because we're recording this right before Christmas and it's funny because I feel like in the farmhouse thing, like a beautifully dressed tree is definitely part of it. But, you know, there could be um, large present trees, you know, trees that you can have inside, like a weeping fig that's like similar to the fiddly fig. I do feel like fiddly figs could look nice too if you have, you know, the sun for them. But some sort of large, I'm trying to think, I keep saying bird of paradise. How many large plants are there really? But even you could do like large, bigger snake plants. You could do large. um, Yeah, no, that's good. (laughs) Also, I feel like farmhouse also like terracotta and patina, like certainly lends itself to this style. And there's a lot of stone, right? Mm -hmm. So like stone fireplaces and you must include more than in the other styles, wood with a wood grain. Yeah. So that's very important in this look. Okay. Whether it's the kitchen island, you know, I never like a wood planter because I'm always trying to think of something that contrasts with the plant. So we're used to seeing brown and green in the plant. And I'm just mm-hmm. generalizing here. I know mm-hmm. that there's other colors of plants now. Uh, no, you're good. Plants. You're good. I just learned that today. Um, so anyway, <laughs> so I'm always trying to think of like what texture would contrast, right? But there are beautiful stone planters. Definitely. So stone could be really beautiful. Yeah. Or a white ceramic glazed planter that doesn't Mm. look perfect because I don't think things can look perfect in this farmhouse design. It has to look a little one-off, a little unique, like, oh, the glazing is a little bit less here and it's less shiny on this side and that kind of thing. Oh, that's so interesting. I love that. Maybe too with farmhouse, like begonias, which have really interesting um, leaf shapes could be really cool because they're kind of unique and I don't know, cozy. A plant can't be cozy, but I feel like begonias with like their different leaf patterns and shapes could probably lend for like a really interesting texture in the farmhouse style. Actually, now that I think about it, begonias could be really cool for glam as well. Um, Cause they're these beautiful plants that have um, some of them have like angel wing shaped leaves that come in all sorts of colors and they're really interesting. So that could be kind of cool. Yeah. When I'm thinking farmhouse, I think you're right. I think it needs to be like a hardier, thicker plant. Yeah. I don't think you could get away with those lacy type plants you were talking about in the beachy style. You need something that can stand up to like a big slab of wood. Yeah. Like peperomia, actually, that's another great point. Peperomia, they have like waxier leaves, thicker leaves. They come in all sorts of varieties and shapes and sizes as well. So that could be really cool. I love that name. I think I need like a cat named Pepperoni. <laughs> yeah. Cat friendly plants too. <laughs> They're cat friendly. That's great. Um, <laughs> okay. Really quick. Yeah. These are just two other words I hear a lot. Scandinavian. Is that more contemporary? Cause Scandinavian is more like clean lines and stuff too. Right. Definitely. And people are embracing that style now, just like they're embracing mid-century modern. Mid-century modern was inspired by Scandinavian design around the same era in the 50s. It's making a comeback now. So those pieces, whether they're authentic from the 50s or whether people are, you know, making knockoffs or inspired pieces, it's really hot right now. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like mid-century and contemporary are aligning because of what is now. And so Scandinavian, because, you know, mid-century modern was inspired by that. It's definitely coming along for the ride. And what are the like key elements of those, you know, two kind of styles? Well, Scandinavian is more that light wood, that kind Mm -hmm. of blonde or even bleached wood, excuse me. Whereas mid-century might be more of that walnut acorn mid-tone wood. Okay. Both of them share a love of lack of ornamentation. It yeah. needs to be very simple. Clean. The lines need to be very linear, not overly ornate, simple shapes, mm-hmm. right? And simple fabrics, not too many patterns, not too over the top, very sort of humble furniture, right? One blanket, uh, not too many blankets. <laughs> yes. And not too many vibrant colors. We're either going to go for neutrals or muted tones. So we're not thinking primaries. We're not thinking loud pops. Okay. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of falls in with, with that. Yeah. This is so fun. This has been so fun. (laughs) I'm just like, ah, I want to move again. I want my own house. I'm so over living in living in furnished apartments, furnished homes. So I can start paying more attention and maybe hire you one day when I move. 
And then I need you to hire to hire you to pick out all my plants. Exactly. Or just come to Trader Joe's with me. And like, yes, <laughs> I'll take you to Trader Joe's. We'll get you some good plants. And um, <laughs> as an interior designer, I'm just curious: Are you seeing? I feel like plants are almost their own style now. Like people love plants so much, and plants are really becoming part of the interior design conversation. At least in my neck of the woods. Do you feel like plants are becoming more and more popular, and are they more and more requested, like with your clients? You know what I think I'm seeing because we've all been stuck inside due to the pandemic, especially because I'm here in the New York city area. So getting to nature is hard. It's not easy to get to nature and central park doesn't necessarily feel safe during the pandemic when you can't kind of define who's in your bubble. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think we were craving plants, greenery. And so we were trying to bring more of that inside. So definitely, like I mentioned at the top of the show, people were pulling me back at the end of our session and saying, Betsy, what about plants? I forgot to mention plants. Did I tell you I need plants? Mm -hmm. And I think they're just missing that connection. Yeah. Totally. Uh, so I think as we come out of the pandemic and people are able to, you know, access nature more easily in urban environments, we might see a little bit less of that. But I think also people are more worried about the environment, getting clean air. Mm-hmm. Right. And so they want those plants not only to represent the outside, but to clean the air inside. Mm hmm. Yeah. So I think there's a few practical reasons. My clients, because I'm in the New York City area, aren't really as interested in decoration as practicality, in my opinion. Yeah, totally. No, that's so interesting. Yeah. I'm curious too. I mean, the plant scene has definitely picked up in the last couple of years. Very thankful for all the popularity. I feel like in 2022, it's going to move into more like what's sustainable statement plants, having a couple of like really plants that bring you a lot of joy instead of feeling overwhelmed with having too many. I'm kind of curious to see how it shakes out on my, in my neck of the woods as well, but this has been so fun. I'm going to binge your podcast when I move so I can learn all the interior design. I love the affordable angle. I feel like, especially for our community, they want to spend their money on plants. They might not necessarily want to spend their money on their design stuff. So where can everyone find you and learn more from you if they want to kind of take more of a, a design deep dive? Of course. Well, they can head over to affordableinteriordesign.com. Not only is our podcast there, you can find our book, you can hire our interior design services. We work virtually as well as in person. Um, But yeah, I think the podcast, because I'm a voracious podcast listener, which Mm -hmm. is how I found you. Mm -hmm. I think the podcast is the best place for people to get started. If they have an interest in interior design, if they want more of these rules, I truly believe that the foundation of good design is rules. And once you know them, you can play with them and play within their confines. And then eventually when you get really good at that, you can break a few of them, but you have to be really good. You have to be really good to break them. But if you play within them, you'll always get a great look. Yeah. I need all the rules, man. And you certainly gave us a lot of rules today, which was awesome. This was so fun. So thank you so much. What a fun, like plant adjacent. At first I was like, does this make sense for Bloominger Radio? But I think this is such a fun plant adjacent thing. We all have homes. We all have plants. Like we need to learn how to, you know, care for our plants successfully and curate a cozy, happy home to live in. So I'm so thankful you took time to hang with us. Go check Betsy out. Affordable interior design is the podcast. Take and take the design test. I had fun taking my design, my eclectic design personality. Um, We'll link to everything in the show notes. So thanks so much, Betsy. You're awesome. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I had a blast and I can't wait to have you on my show. Can't wait. Yes, I'll be over on Betsy's show sometime soon. So go check it out. Bye. All right, plant friends. Thank you, Betsy, for joining us. You can definitely go check out her podcast, Affordable Interior Design, if you are interested in interior design or learning more about it yourself. I love that she really approaches interior design through an affordable lens. Who doesn't love a discount? Who doesn't love a good bargain? She's really lovely. And I know this episode was like plant adjacent, technically about interior design, but with a planty lens. So please let me know if you like these types of episodes and if you would want more of these, what I'm calling kind of like plant adjacent styles. And if you had ideas of other types of episodes like this that you would want to hear, or maybe guests that you want to request, my door is always open, plant friends. And we'll be releasing that uh, listener survey soon for 2022. I can't wait to hear from you. So I hope that 
you take one piece of practical design advice from this episode and apply it to your homes, I'd love to see how you're doing that on Instagram. You can always find me, DM me, tag me. I'm happy to reshare your posts if it's something inspirational in regards to this episode. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile, and with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent, and most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society, rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space off social media, algorithm-free, troll-free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow radio guest, Leslie Halleck all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly Growing Joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like the Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. 
There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will Will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However, that drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 